In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. It's great to be with all of you. And as we start off our conversation, we'd like to invite Mary to be with us. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. And Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. Also, when we pray that beautiful prayer, the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Therefore, my friends, let's uh, start off by praying the prayer that Mary loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary, also known as the Angelic Salutation. Let's place our, our day, our lives, our intentions, our actions in the hands of Mary. As we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now I'd like to invite our spiritual director to come to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the Sweet Guest of Our Souls. Holy Spirit is also known as our Consoler, as well as our Counselor. Holy Spirit is also our interior Master. St. Paul and his letter to the Romans states that we really don't know how to pray as we ought but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's uh, beg the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect as well as the fire of divine love to burn in the very depths of our hearts as we pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Lady Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. 
Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, true, my friends, the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. So after praying with you, I promise to pray for you. In my holy hour this morning in front of the Blessed Sacrament, I place all of you on the altar for when I'll be celebrating Mass later on today. Praying for all of you, when I make my holy hour, I place you on the altar for the, for the intentions of my Mass uh, this morning. No greater prayer in the whole world than the prayer of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. <clears throat> and I really believe that uh, that's really what you, what you want, all of you want more than anything else is prayers, but especially prayers in the context of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So, these are some of our intentions. First, let's pray that we would be open to the Holy Spirit and His workings in our lives. We can pray as such, Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be to pray for our family and our family members. our family and their family members. That our family members will be converted. They'll be converted to the love of Christ. They'll be converted to the love of his mother Mary and that we would grow in grace and persevere until the end. And then, as Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What can we exchange for our soul? And I'd like to pray in a special way for those who will be dying today. That they would die in the peace and the grace of God. I'd like to pray also for all of us that we would receive that gift, the grace of all graces, to die in the state of grace so that we will be saved for all eternity. 
And finally, I'd like to pray for the many people who have made their general confessions. We've already done a couple of days, but we have another week to go, which we're hearing general confessions in the afternoon. We have a, a list of people the next about the next week who will be making their general confessions that God would bless them as well as bless the priests who will be hearing these general confessions. So these are the intentions I'd like to place on the altar and ask you to also pray for these intentions. All right, my friends, before we're entering into the readings for today, we have the image of life-giving waters in Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And then we have also Jesus going to the pool of Siloam healing the paralytic. So what I'd like to what I'd like to do today is uh, I'm finishing basically the Apostles' Creed that we've been going over the past few weeks. What we're doing, we're giving a brief catechesis before entering into the riches of the Word of God. So we've arrived in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed. We Yesterday we spoke about, we believe in the resurrection. The resurrection from the dead. We spoke about that. That Jesus will be celebrating the Easter Triduum in a relatively short time, in about two weeks. And we arrive at what is called the plenitude of the Paschal Mystery. And the Paschal Mystery is the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. So we, in the Creed, we believe in the resurrection from the dead, that Christ rose from the dead. and by him rising from the dead on the third day. He has obtained for us life and life in abundance. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you have life and life in abundance. I've come that you have life and life in abundance. So by Jesus dying on Good Friday, being buried, and the third day rising from the dead, he's opened up the gates of heaven that were closed because of the sins of Adam and Eve. He's opened up the gates of heaven so that all of us can have access to heaven and eternal life. And that's how the Creed ends, the Apostles' Creed ends. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and our catechesis today and life eternal. So our life in the next world will not be temporary, will not be transitory, will not be ephemeral, will not be partial, but our life with the Lord in heaven will be eternal. It will be forever and ever and ever and ever. 
when they give the spiritual exercises program, when they give the spiritual exercises program, the third week of my 10-week program, we meditate upon the last things. In theology, the word is eschatology. Eschatology means the it means the theology of the theology of the last things. The theology of the last things. So the theology of the last things would be. The reality of death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, and all of this is permeated, penetrated, imbued with the reality of eternal life. You know, Lady Fatima said many years ago that if the world would just meditate upon eternity, there would be salvation. Both heaven and the reality of hell are not, are not temporal realities, but they are eternal realities. So let's long, as we finish commenting upon the creed, let's long as we contemplate meditating upon the creed, let's long for eternal <coughs> life in heaven with the Lord. And I love this verse from the psalm, Psalm 41, verse 1. As the deer yearns for the running streams, as the deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord my God. As we head toward Holy Week, let us be longing, yearning for the Lord and for eternal life. Amen. All right, my friends. Let's, uh, let's move into the Word of God. Ezekiel speaks about entering into the water, going deeper and deeper, ankle, waist, chest. And the water gets so deep that we have to that the per, that Ezekiel has to swim across the the water. And he speaks about this life giving water that brings forth plants and trees and fruits and teeming with fish. Life-giving water. That's the essence of the first reading. Water, but not stagnant water, but life-giving water. Even Jesus said to the Samaritan in John chapter 4, Give me to drink. St. Augustine quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, Jesus thirsts that we thirst for him. Jesus hungers that we hunger for him. May we hunger for Jesus, the bread of life, as we read in John chapter 6. So this is a beautiful passage of Ezekiel from the 47th chapter. The life-giving water. 
the life-giving water. And there's a parallel between that and the gospel. The response over our psalm is, the Lord of hosts is with us. Our stronghold is the God of Jacob. Yes, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If God is with us, who can be against us? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my rock and security. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. So, yesterday, my friends, we're, we're reading through the Gospel of St. John now. As mentioned yesterday, the Gospel of John is the Gospel of the signs. Sign in the Johannine vocabulary means basically miracles and there are actually seven signs there are actually seven signs in the gospel of saint john seven signs we might even stop and ask ourselves why 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 miracles anyway and Jesus said to those who were incredulous, he said that if you don't believe in my words, if you don't believe in my words, then believe at least in my miracles, my actions. So we see in the gospel yesterday and today, Jesus working miracles Miracles of healing. Jesus is the divine physician. That's right. Jesus is the divine physician. He's the doctor. He's a doctor. And I think as we meditate upon the gospel yesterday and today, my style in preaching is to give you a summary of the passage. Then I'd like to give you an interpretation. Then after the interpretation, I'd like to give you a practical application. So the text, the interpretation, and the application. When we're reading and meditating upon the Word of God, it shouldn't be something that's something that happened 2,000 years ago. A distant, remote happening that has no effect upon our lives, but rather it should, it should affect us today. So, to be honest, we are, we are the sick person. We should identify ourselves with the sick person because of original sin and personal sin. We get sick, but thanks be to God, there's a doctor in the house. And that doctor is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a doctor in the house. That doctor is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So yesterday we had the royal official that implores our Lord to help his child that was sick to the point of death. He begs the Lord to heal him, and our Lord says, go on your way, he's healed. And this royal official actually believed in the words of Jesus, that 
Jesus, the divine physician. Healed his son. So as he was heading back to his house, his servants approach him, bringing him the joyful news that his son has been healed. He asked them, what time did this happen at? And they said, about one o'clock. That was the time in which the royal official heard Jesus saying, go, your son is healed. Let's revisit that and imitate this royal official with intercession. We all know family members that perhaps maybe they're not physically sick, but we know family members that are spiritually sick. They have walked away from the church. They no longer receive the sacraments. They've turned their back on God like the prodigal son. They're maybe angry or disgruntled against the church. Perhaps they've fallen into a state of lukewarmness, mediocrity, tepidity, or perhaps they are slaves of their sins, slaves of some type of vice, lust or greed or whatever it might be. Like this royal official, we should intercede for these people, begging the Lord, the divine physician, to heal them. So that's a kind of a recap or a review of yesterday. And that can be found in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So today we're going to see Jesus working another miracle. So there's a feast of the Jews. So for this feast of the Jews, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem to the place called the Sheep Gate. And it was like a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda that had it had five portico five porticos. And this is a place, basically a place of healing, kind of like you might even imagine Lourdes in France, Our Lady of Lourdes, or Anne de Beaupre in Canada, places where there are healings that would come about. So we got the five porticos at the Sheep Gate and and people would come and they would bring their sick relatives there. It'd be the ill, the ill people, the, the blind, the lame, as well as the cripples. And they would be waiting for what they believed for the angel to come and to stir the water. And if they're able to get descend into the water, when the water was being healed, it's kind of like 
Ezekiel 37, there'd be healing properties of the water. That's right, healing properties of the water. But they believed that they had to they had to they had to descend into the water. So here's the key encounter for today. So this was the Sabbath day for the Jews. This would be Saturdays, the Sabbath day for the Jews. <clears throat> Jesus encounters this man who is suffering greatly and he was uh, he was he was a paralytic. He couldn't walk. He was suffering this infirmity <clears throat> for 38 long years. So Jesus sees him there and he asks him a very simple question. Do you want to be well? We can even go to the Lord with our own spiritual, moral infirmities. Perhaps Jesus is asking us in this Perseverance family where we all have moral and spiritual sicknesses. Do you want to be well? You might even bring that to prayer today. That question, do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed of your sickness? And don't forget that Jesus is the divine physician. We saw him heal the, the boy yesterday. We're going to see it again today. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? Now the sick man right away jumped to the conclusion that the way if he were to be healed then he'd have to be lowered into the water. Lowered into the water. That was the only thing that really occurred to him. But don't forget that Jesus is God and he's the divine physician. And he turns to this man the man says this, I have no one to lower me into the water. So when the water is stirred up, while I am on my way, someone else gets down there before me. So this implies that you have just a, a lot of sick people A lot of people, sick people that are laying there and some of them are so disabled that they cannot move, they cannot move themselves. They have to have some person of goodwill lowering them into the water. This poor man has no one there to help him to lower into the water. Now Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, who is the divine physician. 
he says to this paralytic in very few words, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. Immediately. The man became well, took up his mat, and he started to walk. In the silent of our prayers this day, we can turn to the Lord, the Divine Physician, and we can talk to the Lord who's come to heal us. We can ask the Lord, 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 Heal me. Lord, heal me of my past memories that come to haunt me in the present. Lord, heal my mind, sometimes darkened with sin. Lord, heal my imagination, which is la loca de la casa. Lord, heal my eyes that I will contemplate only what is beautiful in your sight. Lord, heal my ears that they may be purified of the things that have allowed to enter into my ears which are not pleasing to you. Lord, heal my tongue For all the times when I've said certain words that have not been pleasing to you. Lord, heal my unruly emotions and passions that seem to re rebel against me at times. Lord, heal my soul which has been soiled because of my own sinful past. Lord, you the divine physician, Lord, heal my heart. Lord, when I go to communion, you who are the divine physician, give me a spiritual heart transplant a spiritual heart transplant every time I approach you, Lord, who are the divine physician. So, my friends, I've expressed to you a prayer that we can bring. A prayer that we can bring to Jesus, the divine physician. He heals the son of the royal official, and now we see Jesus healing this paralytic. Who's been sick for 38 long years. We can also Add to this prayer that the Lord would heal many of our brothers and sisters that are spiritually and morally blind, deaf, lame, paralyzed. Perhaps they are even spiritually dead that the Lord will heal them 
and the Lord can even bring them back to life. Jesus said that I've come to bring, bring life and life in abundance. I've come that you have life and life in abundance. Following this healing, Once again, we encounter some of the Jews who are spiritually blind. And that's why Mary Jo is struggling with seeing how they could not be re rejoice at such an incredible miracle. Good point, Mary Jo. And the response is, our, our sin has a tendency to blind us. And these Jews were blinded, especially by their own pride and jealousy and envy. They were aware that Jesus carried out this miracle and they were, they were jealous of him. And what they do is they start, they criticize this man because they say, even though he's paralyzed, for 38 years, the only thing they could see is that he picked up his mat and he started to walk he was healed and he was not supposed to pick up his mat and walk because it's the Sabbath day. How blind. Our sin does blind us. There is a Spanish proverb. I like proverbs. There's a Spanish proverb that can be applicable to this gospel. And I'll say it in Spanish and then I'll translate it into English. And it goes like this. No en pior ciego que aquel que no quiere ver. No en pior sordo que aquel que no quiere oír. Sure, Carmen and Alondra, who are bilingual, know what that means. But this would be the translation. There's no worse blind person than the blind person that does not want to see. There's no worse deaf person than the deaf person that does not want to hear. Those are the worst. Those are the people who say, I don't need Jesus Christ. I'm not a sinner. Those are the group, groups of people that are in most serious danger because Jesus, Jesus can only heal those Jesus can only heal those, the sick, that humbly admit that they are sick. He can only heal the blind that recognize that they are blind. He can only heal the deaf that recognize that their hearing is impaired. So 
So the gospel continues. The paralytic that's been healed enters into dialogue with these Jews and he says that Jesus was the one that healed him. Now Jesus is going to confront this man and he's going to say something to him that I think we should all meditate upon. So Jesus finds this man and he, he gives him a warning. He says to him, look, you're well. You're well now, you're healed. And Jesus says, do not sin Sin no more, so that nothing worse may happen to you. Once again, Jesus approaches this, the man that's been healed, and he says, look, do not sin, so that something worse may not happen to you. And we have to be dead honest with ourselves that we were born with sin. We've been liberated by baptism. But we have still these bad tendencies within us. They're called the capital sins. Aquinas calls it concupiscence. Concupiscence. Let us pray. Remember the three practices we mentioned many times to really live out Lent and to arrive at conversion. We're called to go up, we're called to go in, we're called to go out. We're called to go up, we're called to go in, we're called to go out. We go up through prayer. We go in through penance and fasting. We go out by almsgiving and the practice of charity, you might even call the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. When we talk about fasting, self-denial, the practice of the ascetical life to arrive at the mystical life, one of the best fastings we can do in the season of Lent, heading toward Holy Week, would to be fast to fast from the reality of sin. And we might even look into our own hearts and see if we have to fast from, from gluttony or from lust or from avarice or greed or from sloth or laziness or from anger and impatience or perhaps we're jealous or envious. And the root cause of all sins 
is an overweening pride that can get hold of all of us. That actually can be our type of fasting to say no to sin. Yesterday in the spiritual exercise I spoke about sin is ugliness. Sin is deformation. Whereas the practice of virtue is beauty. We want to have the beauty of our soul, the beauty of virtue, the beauty of, of holiness. So in a certain sense, we are the paralytic. And we know paralytics, our relatives and our friends. So let's humbly ask our Lord and his mother Mary for healing. And I'd like to pray for myself as well as for all of you that the Lord would help us not to go back to the past. But through Mary's prayers and the prayers of good Saint Joseph that we would say no to sin no to paralysis, no to sin. And yes to the love of God and lo yes to a life of virtue and holiness. May we experience Ezekiel 37, the life-giving waters to heal us, to strengthen us so that we will bring forth fruit and fruit in abundance. And I'd like to give all of you my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many blessings on all of you. And you may you experience the peace, the love, the joy, and the healing of Jesus Christ, our divine physician, Lord, God, and Savior. Amen.